Hello everybody, welcome back to the Mighty Glue Stick. You're speaking with AJ and today I'm going to bring you one of my favourite D&D creatures. One that's been around since the dawn of the game and that is the Kobold. Now there's been a, um, a few monster videos by other people on YouTube about Kobolds as of late. Um, so I thought I'd give you a, a bit more of an intensive um, lesson on kobolds and let's first of all look at exactly what they are. So the modern kobold is a draconian uh, reptilian humanoid, small fairly frail humanoid. Um, they've got a strength of 7, dexterity of 16, con of 9, intelligence of 8, wisdom of 7 and a charisma of 8. They've got an armor class of 13 and a mere 7 or 5 hit points. Um, so we've got the winged kobolds, uh, known as the Erd, and we've got just regular kobolds. Okay, so that's their basics, and um, they're primarily uh, subterranean, so they've got a sunlight sensitivity and dark vision of 60 feet, um, fair passive perception of 8, and they speak common and draconian, dra uh, draconic, and they have the ability to use pack tactics, and typically used drop rocks, daggers, slings, um, spears, sticks, that sort of thing. Right, so that's the basics. Now, the history of the kobold goes back all the way to the start of the game, back in 1973-1974, where the uh, very first kobolds um, were kind of goblin-like, and they took this originally from the Germanic folklore, where kobold is basically a, a word for a sprite, um, kind of like a gnome. And it wasn't until, uh, and they were basically considered to be s similar to goblins, but weaker. And it wasn't until about 1977 that we start to see the evolution of the kobold as a reptilian um, thing, which is quite different from a goblin. And at around this time, they became a playable race in many different supplements. You could actually play a kobold. Um, this has sort of fallen out of fashion in the game. And as we progress through the years into 1989, 1999, we see the introduction of the Erd, the wing version of the Kobold, uh, and the Dragon Mountain Kobold. And then we're getting more into the 2003, 2007, where we have the diversification of different species through 3.5s, um, aquatic Kobolds, Arctic Kobolds, Desert Kobolds, Earth Kobolds, Jungle Kobolds. Um, and we see the ecology of the Kobold is first explored in Dragon 330. To in uh, June of 2005. And then we get into Dungeons and Dragons 4th edition and we see the Kobold as a, as a solid uh, race and the, the modern version of the Kobold that we know and love has been cemented into. It's a, a creature which is quite well organized. It's a toady of the, of the dragon races, uh, the dragon kind, and they are the masters of vermin and traps. And um, yeah, so if we look at the, the ecology of the kobold, they speak a version of the draconic tongue and which with a yipping accent. They have kind of a dog-like um, face to them. They're, they're elongated draconian, draconian skulls um, are sort of incongruous on their bodies. They, they, their heads are quite large compared to the rest of them. But as we can see in the 5th edition version, if you're looking at the monster manual page, you'll see that the, the creature is quite stocky and almost powerful looking. But again, they're the size of a child. Uh, they're tiny. Um, whereas, I mean, they could get they can get into a fist fight with a uh, a halfling, and the halfling would probably win. That's that's kobolds for you. They're they're just not very not very uh, sturdy. <clears throat> and what they make up for it is in having a high birth rate and a fairly high death rate. Um, they're egg layers, and they raise the eggs um, in clutches, um, hard shelled eggs that. Um, hatch after uh, two weeks after fertilization so they they incubate for um, an additional oh sorry they incubate for 60 days before hatching and they reach the maturity at age eight or nine and they're considered to be great worms or leaders of their community at age of 121 and they can live up to 135 years um, when they do bond with one another they have no concept of monoton uh, monogamy and they, their society is, is basically duty driven um, and they just mate when they need to. And 
one of the other things with the the kobolds is their society is quite variable um depending on where they are who they're with and uh, what dragon they're serving their culture individual culture can be quite diverse um and you'll see this reflected in their appearance their mannerisms and things like that even um whatever language they speak may be inflected heavily by um the influence of say they're serving a black dragon or a red dragon they'll have quite different attitudes towards things uh, they've got an extreme hatred of gnomes whom they compete for in some areas and mining rights as well as pixies brownies and sprites just because they share some of the same uh, ecological niches they're often at war with goblins since they um, are located in the same underground areas and numerous goblin uh, kobold and goblin wars wages through the underdark at all times um, completely beyond the notice of uh, the surface world populations um, Zvarts, which is another species, act as intermediaries between kobolds and goblins, uh, usually dominating and taking out their aggression on the kobolds, unfortunately. So kobolds are like the, they're the little man, they're the, they're the plucky sidekicks, they're the, they're the fall guys and the butt of every single joke, and they're usually um, at the receiving end of most of the bad stuff which happens below ground. Uh, but because they just, they're just plucky little triers and they just carry on. Um, and the key to it is the fact that they have uh, dragon blood. Although they're dog-like and they've got rat-like little tails and they've got little stubby horns and their hairless scaly skin is dragon, dragon lit-ish, um, they, they are actually dragons. They're, they're of a dragon kind. Um, and so they've got this inhuman ability to just persevere and adapt to environments and um, just make it. So they stand about 2 to 2, two foot 8 in 3.5 edition D&D. They increase to about 3 foot 6 to 4 foot in 4th edition. Um, and we assume that they're about the same size in 5th edition. So they've got scaly hairless eyes, reptilian heads, heads and tails. They weigh about 30 pounds. Uh, or 18 or 40 pounds or 18 kg in fourth edition um, and the males are about three inches taller than the females although the females are usually a bit more dominant uh, because of the that breeding cycle that they have hides are typically rust brown or reddish black in color and ivory colored horns although uh, that's quite variable and um, it really depends on what location they're in and things the eyes glow a little bit red uh, they can accurately see in lightless, lightless conditions, and they're described as smelling like a cross between damp dogs and stagnant water. Um, unlike dragons, they are actually cold-blooded, and the scales covering their bodies are like an iguana or a large lizard, and the um, scales that cover their tails are very fine, so that they resemble naked tails of rats. Um, they lose and gain teeth throughout their lives, often um, saving and making necklaces out of them. So they're constantly growing new teeth. And they favour raggedy looking red or orange clothing made from leather or the silk of giant spiders. Um, they never wear shoes and they are actually fond of making jewellery and ornamentation that they, they craft themselves. Crafting and mining are something that uh, kobolds do very well and they um, they are capable of epic levels of engineering because they are usually under the employ of dragons and they work and service and worship dragons as living gods which to them is completely understandable um, dragons are of a kind to them so they feel a blood kinship with dragons of course this is not exactly reciprocated by the large draconian kin who basically consider kobolds to be exactly what they are lesser life forms only worthy of service so the the kobolds do have their own religion and society they um they worship kutulmuk uh, and legends tell of how kutulmuk served as tiamat's vassal in the nine hells until gal glittergold the god of the gnomes stole the trinket from the dragon queen's hoard and tiamat sent kutulmuk to retrieve the trinket but gal glittergold played a trick on him on him collapsing the earth and trapping the kobold god in an underground maze for eternity and for this reasons among others the kobolds hate the gnomes and their pranks however 
This being said, kobolds are consummate ambush artists and trap makers. So when I'm employing kobolds in a game, I'll impl well, the first thing you're going to be aware of is the fact that you're entering into a trap-filled area full of pit traps, pit traps with spikes, pit traps with oozes in the bottom, funnel-shaped traps with uh, excrement-smeared blades on the wall, so you slide down into a point, um, spikes that drop out of the ceiling, pit traps with spikes and excrement, rope snares, snares with attached to violet fungus or shriekers, uh, pressure plates and kiss and mating traps with stones that bounce out of the ground and smash you in the face, dart traps from every direction, fire traps, we basically stand on it and set off a, a bag of oil. Oh, my favourite, the hypodermic, hypodermic poo spear trap, where you're walking along the corridor, you set off some sort of a trigger, whether it's a snare or a rope or something like that, or a pressure plate under the ground, a spear jabs out, slams into you, pierces your hide, and then another shaft inside the spear pushes through the spear and squeezes poo into your body cavity. Then you've got the ankle blade swing trap, the explosive pool traps, rust monsters in pits or just released into corridors, or kobolds which are flinging missiles at you while riding rust monsters, gelatinous cubes, uh, green slimes and buckets that are left suspended over doorways, um, all kinds of acid, dust clouds, or even dust clouds made out of stinging insects, poison spores from uh, myconids or other insect varieties, bags of insect swarms, tanglefoot bags, um, roof holes or murder holes where they basically just stand in a little tunnel above the, the, the uh, corridor and um, thrust down with javelins, or from the sides or from the floor underneath you, uh, false floors so that you're walking along the corridor and it collapses underneath you and they just stab you from the side. Um, poisonous gas or even um, natural gas or the invisible fire which you can't actually see until you stick your hand in it. Toxic gas, bad air filled corridors that are um, accessed by a, um, a water lock. So they've dug um, underneath a wall and filled it with water and they've filled one room up with poisonous gas and then another little thing somewhere else so that they've got a, an escape hole and they've pulled through breathing tubes that you don't actually notice until you're in the room and the only way to avoid it is to pull the tube out from, well, if you see the, the opening of the tube um, on the waterway that you're about to go into, then you can pull the tube through and breathe in on it as you're going through the room, but you don't actually notice that straight away without a good check. And of course, um, if they're protecting a, a dragon's hoard, they may scatter gold coins on the ground, which are actually filled um, like a fragile hip flask full of acid, because the acid, of course, doesn't burn through the gold. So... You should be very wary of kobolds. They are consummate ambush artists and they build all kinds of traps and basically anything you can think of, as long as it's not too mechanically complicated. Um, if they can just do it with a pickaxe and some twine and uh, a bit of spider silk and some spiky bits and things that they've gathered from the environment, go for it. Be creative as you possibly can be because that's, there are whole sections of people in their society which dedicate themselves to nothing but learning how to make nasty traps because the entire environment as far as they're, con they're concerned is out to kill them and they are xenophobic for a reason because everybody wants to kill them including the people that they serve namely red dragons black dragons green dragons that kind of thing now that being said um and the fact that they are lawful evil um they're evil with a purpose so they're not evil on a whim um and if the situation is such that they need to infiltrate your party or something like that, they can actually emulate a helper, a helpful little toady guide who comes along and, and is weirdly little yippy voice. He actually tries to help you out and guide you to wherever you need to go. But the truth is, he's under the employ of a, uh, a dragon. The dragon has directed him to go into your group and lead you into an ambush 100% of the time. Um, and that's okay. That's fine. And you can pull that trick on your players as much as you want, because every time they, uh, they let you get away with it, you just put another feather in your cap of your kobold arsenal. So they're tunnelers and builders, and they exist in vast numbers, scattered around the place under the employ of um, larger and more evil foes. It doesn't necessarily have to be a dragon. It could be something else. So, yeah, the... Uh, the kobolds are definitely one of my favourite little creatures to throw against people, particularly when um, the players have a, a, a sense that 
they're above and beyond small creatures. Um, the, the, the feeble little kobold can bring the mighty down. And um, yeah, I, I would say use them f for exactly that. Bring bring the mighty down with the, the kobolds, put them in an environment underground where they're out of their element. Um, the kobolds uh, can't be reasoned with, they're fanatically um, loyal to their dragon lieges, um, and their, their society is wholly focused on that. They can't be bought or persuaded. They exist only for themselves, for survival, and for the protection of their dragon masters and uh, and in service of the dragon masters and that's about it you, you can't reason with them you can't turn them like undead and they can swarm over you in seconds and slice you to pieces with jagged little knives so yeah I also like involving people in um, kobold politics because there's different rival bunches of kobolds which are working on uh, over vast areas where they may overlap territories of different dragons and the kobolds will actually fight amongst themselves for resources and things so if the underground environment is too dangerous for a kobold band with supplies and things to navigate they'll come up onto the surface and travel across the surface as well where they'll come across of all sorts of different creatures so you may actually get involved in some sort of a gob uh, kobold goblin civil war um, just in passing, as you're walking through the wilderness, far away from civilization, there are other civilizations which exist, you know, so then you're not just the only humanoids around, there's also kobolds, and I look forward to the day one day, hopefully soon, where kobolds come back as a playable race, because they are really quite awesome, um, but that being said, I just love those devious little bastards.